turn to Romans chapter 8. We're going to go back to Romans. Actually, it's our text, but we're going to read some verses out of 1 Corinthians. Uh, again, just some wonderful verses of Scripture that mean a lot. Mean a lot. You know, I hear all kinds of people talking about, you know, I've, I've, I've talked to a lot of people who maybe were in marriages that ended and, uh, and you know, I, I, I get talking to them and ask them, well, what happened? Well, we just fell out of love. That's hard for me to fathom, okay? I'm not saying, I just don't think it can't happen. If you truly love somebody, it never ends. And there's a reason I say that, okay? Uh, you may have had some differences that you just couldn't get past. I understand that. People do from, you know, uh, I have to, have to split sometimes. But I never understood the concept that you can fall out of love with somebody because of the love that we know as Christians, number one, from God, which is what we're going to be talking about today, and the love that we have for our spouse. I mean, I love my wife. I loved her the first time I ever saw her, and that was a long time ago, okay? And I love her more today than I loved her back then. And to be honest with you, I was so young the first time I ever saw her, I didn't really know what love was. But I knew there was something stirring in there. And, and you know, it, it, I cannot imagine a day that I would wake up and say, I don't love her anymore, because that can't happen. Not with me, it can't. And there's a reason for that. And Paul, you know, we were talking about these questions, these unanswerable questions that Paul asked in Romans chapter 8. And there are five of them. And we're going to get to the last one today. And as far as I'm concerned, it's the best one. Okay? It's the best one. He, 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 he starts listing these questions, you know, and he says in verse 31 of chapter 8, he says, who can be against us? If God be for us, who can be against us? Well, the obvious answer is nobody. Nobody can be against us if, if Christ is on our side. Verse 32, he says, you know, he gave his only son for us, so how will he not graciously give us all things? He's already given us the greatest gift the, the, that he had, so why would he withhold anything else? And the answer is, he won't withhold anything else from those who he loves. And verse 33 says, who will bring any charge against us? There's nobody that can bring a charge against the children of God. He goes on in verse 34 and says, who will condemn us? Look, if God's already justified us, we can't be condemned. Now, when I say that, I say, I say it, uh, this as a qualifying statement. Satan cannot condemn us in the eyes of God. He can't even come into the court of heaven and try to condemn us because guess what? God's already justified us. And if He's already justified us, then Satan can't do a thing. Now here on this earth, there might be people who want to condemn us and they may condemn us unjustly. But folks, let me tell you something. When it comes to eternity and the thing comes, <coughs> nobody can condemn us. And you know what? The greatest realization that a Christian can come to, the greatest realization that a Christian can come to is that nothing can separate us from the love of God. That's the greatest thing. We understand that nothing can separate us. We are secure from that point on. We are. But now we're talking about the love of Christ, right? And the love of God. Well, what is it about love? What is the nature of love? Now, uh, you know, if you don't, if you if you don't want to stand for the whole time, that's fine. I don't care. But we're fixing to read 1 Corinthians chapter thirteen, the first eight verses, and then we're going to flip back to Romans chapter eight. So stand with me if you would. The first thing I want to look at is the nature of love. Okay, the nature of the love of God. Paul says, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not love. King James says charity, but it, it translates from the Greek to love. He says, so I speak with the tongues of men and angels and have not love. I am become as a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understanding, uh, and I understand all mysteries and knowledge, and though I have faith so that I could remove mountains and have not love. I'm nothing. 
And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and I give my body to be burned and have not love, it profiteth me nothing. And now is where we get in to the nature of love. Listen to what Paul is telling the Corinthians that love really is. Charity suffers long. You know what that means? It's patient. <laughs> uh, boy, we could do a whole sermon on patience, couldn't we? Charity suffereth long. It is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up. That means it doesn't push itself on somebody. Let me tell you something. If you have genuine godly love, you don't have to push it on anybody. They'll recognize it and they'll accept it. Verse 5, it does not behave itself unseemly, seeks not her own, is not easily provoked, and thinketh no evil. It rejoices not in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things. It believes all things. It hopes all things. Endures all things. Here's the best part. Love never fails. True love doesn't go away. Now flip over to Romans chapter 8. Now that we know a little bit about the nature of love. And that love right there Paul was talking about is godly love. Okay? Now, how much do we realize just how much Christ loves us? He says right here, he asks the question, who can separate us from the love of God? Shall tribulation, this is in verse 35, shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sore, as it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Father, I pray that you would help us to understand just how great your love for us is today. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that we might be willing to take that love and show it to other people so that they might understand it as well. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. Listen, Paul understood that the Christian life is not easy. Paul probably understood that more than anybody else. But he says, even though times get hard, even though there are things that come into our path that beset us as Christians, we still can't be separated from the love of God. You know, you see somebody that goes through the persecution that Paul had been through. You stop and think about Paul's life and his missionary journeys. Come on. He was beaten more than once. He was in prison more than once. He was put under threat of death more than once. He was run out of all towns that he went to just about. He was shipwrecked and, and all stranded on an island. I mean, this man understood what a hard life was. But guess what? He was happy through it all. You know why? Because he understood that nothing could separate God's love from him. That's how we find joy no matter what happens to us is knowing that the love of God is still there. And he goes on and he starts to list some things that people think will separate us from God's love. The first thing he talks about is trouble. He says, look, in the Christian life, you will have trouble. The Bible says that. The Bible is very clear. Folks, we are not exempt from a hard time just because God is our God and our Savior. He said we're going to have to go through things just like everybody else does. So we will have trouble in our life. And some translations of the Bible say tribulation. If you look right at verse 35, the King James said, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation. Tribulation comes from a Greek word called tribulum. Tribulum was not so much a word as a thing. It's a noun. A tribulum was a sled that had metal on the bottom of it. It was weighted. And when they would bring the, the, the grain to the threshing floor, they had to separate the heads of grain from the stalk. And so what they would do is they'd spread this out on a, on a big uh, threshing floor, they call it a big flat area, 
And then they would take this tribulum, this sled that was weighted, and they would pull it across the, the, the wheat, and it would, because of the weight pressing down, it would separate the heads of grain from the stalk. And it was called a tribulum. And so we get our modern day word tribulation from it. And basically what that tells us is this, you have constant pressure on you when you go through tribulation. You ever felt that way? You ever felt like there was just this constant pressure on you to do something or, or to, uh, you know, and it's just almost unbearable. This burden that comes upon you. Have you ever felt that way? You know what? There are different things in our lives that can cause pressure, right? I mean, look, we, a minute ago we were talking about marriage. Look, a lot of times marriages can, can get pretty stressful. <laughs> you know? And, and that brings pressure to bear upon us. Not only that, what about in our job? There are pressures in our job that we've got to get this done or we've got to get that done or we're trying to make this person happy or that person happy. And folks, it's just constant pressure. How do you feel when you get to that point? What does it feel like? It's miserable. But Paul says that's the kind of, that's the kind of trouble that we as Christians can have. He says those hostile forces that come against us. Look, he realized what hostile forces were. You know, he was, he was whipped. Now, you know, most of us, when we talk about whipping, it brings back a very unpleasant memory. Mm -hmm. But the whippings we got as young wasn't nothing compared to what the Bible is talking about when they whipped him. It tore flesh. And it tore it away from the body. Folks, a lot of people didn't survive it. It was brutal. It was bloody. It was bad. And Paul had been there. And guess what? They beat him illegally. It was illegal what they did. He was a Roman citizen and they could not do that to him, but they did it anyway. You know why? Because he was stood for Christ. Now what does that tell us? It tells us that sometimes hostile forces are going to come upon us. Simply because we are Christians, we're going to be treated that way. Lots of things, lots of forces come against us as Christians. The main one and the one behind all of it is Satan. Satan doesn't like Christians. Satan doesn't want Christians telling other people about Christ. Satan can't stand us. And he wants to destroy us. The Bible tells us that. He uh, roams to and fro, <laughs> seeking whom he may devour. Folks, trouble will come. Hostile forces will come against us. But he also says that we'll have hardship, distress. The Greek word here is actually a combination of two words. The first one means narrow, and the second one means space. A narrow space. You ever been in a narrow space? <laughs> Anybody claustrophobic? You know, you get enclosed in a tiny space, how does it make you feel? You know, I never have thought I was real claustrophobic. But, uh, you know, before I had shoulder surgery, I had to go for an MRI. Y'all know, you get split up in the tube. And, you know, if you open your eyes, the tube is right there. And you're like, I can't breathe. You know? You know what the worst part of that thing was? Because I knew it was going to be close in there. And I knew, you know, people tell me, oh, man, if you're claustrophobic, you ain't going to be able to make it, blah, blah, blah. So, you know, I just said, well, when they start sliding me up in, I'm going to close mine. I won't know how close it is. It'll be fine. And, and I was fine. Other than the fact that I was, you know, doing this shoulder, he said, now, here's what you got to do. And there was enough room side to side in this one where, where we would do it. He said, you got to put the arm that's hurt like this. Y'all ever had a torn rotator cuff and a torn bicep and tried to do your arm like that? Let me tell you something, that was 30 minutes of some of the worst pain I've ever had in my life. So I prayed a lot while I was in there. But you know what? It didn't bother me to be in there because I had my eyes closed. I couldn't tell. Folks, let me tell you something. When Paul says we're going to have distress, when we're going to have hardship, it means a narrow space. We're going to be confined by things. What do we pride ourselves in this country with more than anything else? 
our freedom. Our freedom. Man, son, can you imagine a time when they tell you that you've got to stay inside your house? And you can't go in. You gotta stay inside your house. How long is it gonna be before people start going crazy? Why? Because we want to be able to get out and go like we want to. We want to be able to get out and do what we want to. Folks, let me tell you something. Paul is telling us that in the Christian life, they're gonna, there's gonna be hardship that comes that will confine us. What kind of hardship is he talking about? Well, he doesn't go into explanation other than say it's going to be a confining circumstance. You know, I, 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 I was in the business for a while uh, of confining people. You know, and what I try to tell every student that I teach in the police academy is this. Look, you are fixing to be given a whole lot of authority. You are going to be given uh, an awesome responsibility. Just remember this. As a law enforcement officer, you have the ability to take away a person's freedom. Don't take that lightly and don't dare abuse or misuse that law. Folks, you know, I, I got a lot of friends that are in corrections or were in corrections. And I tell them, God bless you. I'll send you business all day long, but I do not want your job. Because I like being outside, not inside. But there are circumstances that come upon us as Christians that are confining. They're confining. They limit us, and we don't like that. That's hard. Paul says that's going to happen. He says persecution's going to going to come upon us. Now the Greek word used there is dioko. And what that simply means is a person who is uh, pursuing you with the intent to harm you. Someone pursuing you with the intent of harming you. Oh, stop and think about this. Somebody wants to harm you physically. You know what? In Paul's day, people were pursuing Christians to intentionally harm them. But boy, how the roles change. Because think about Paul. What was Paul doing before he met Christ? He was pursuing Christians with the intent of harming them. He put them to death. That may come again. In fact, it's still going on. It never stopped. It still goes on today. You need to be sure of two things, folks. There's two things that we absolutely have to be sure of as Christians. Now, this is for people who are Christians. The first thing we need to remember is that persecution is a normal response to your faith in Christ. Persecution is a normal response by the world to your faith. If you stand up for Jesus Christ, you will be persecuted in one way or another. Because the world does not like Christians. The world is following Satan, and Satan hates Christ and hates Christians. So if you make a stand for Christ, you will be persecuted. You will endure or experience persecution if you stand for Christ. And you know what? It doesn't have to be death. It could be. But you know what? It could be simply just uh, being shunned. You know, how fun is that? Remember when you were a kid and you know, nobody wanted to pick you for their teeth? That's a form of being shunned, ain't it? Sure it is. Nobody wanted to pick you. Folks, we will be shunned as Christians. People won't want to be around us. We'll be, you know, we'll, we'll be passed over according to the world because they don't want us to hold important positions. You know, why, is, why do we not have any, what I call, really devout Christians? I'm not going to say that none of them are Christians in Washington, although I really wonder. Why do we have any devout Christians in, in places or in positions of power? It's because the world don't want them. And it's because the devil will do everything he can to keep them from that. 
That's why I think we need a law in this country that says before you even run for office, you have to show at least 20 years of dedicated service to Christ to prove that you are a born-again Christian and you believe what the Bible says and you live it. Can you imagine what our country would be like if Washington was full of people like that? It would be a lot different than it is right now. I tell you what Satan wants. Look, we're going to get passed over. We're going to get sued. And we may be in prison just for being, just for being a Christian. Paul goes on and he says famine will come again. You know, famine has never ended. There are places in this world right now where people are starving to death. You know, I always told Diane, when our boys were, you know, teenagers and played ball in high school, I tried to go to every game they had. But if there was a time when they had an away game and I couldn't go or something like that, I always made sure they had some money in their pocket so they could eat. You know what? And I had to get on to them sometimes and say, why are you giving so much money? I said, because I cannot stand the thought of my child being somewhere without me and hunger. I can't stand it. And, and famine still goes on today. Hunger is a terrible thing, folks, and there are people in this world, a lot of Christians, who are starving today. And then he goes on and he says, shall nakedness now, most people, when they see nakedness, they think of somebody that don't have any clothes on. And literally, that's what that means. But does Paul mean literally a bunch of Christians running around without any clothes on? No. He simply means this, that they are so poor that they cannot afford the basic necessities of life like clothes to cover themselves. This has more to do with an economic status. Folks, let me tell you something. The world will do everything they can to destroy a Christian. You know what the Bible also says? The love of what is the root of all evil? Money. You know how the Antichrist is going to get come on the scene? You know how the Antichrist is going to take over the world? It's all going to have to do with the money. You know what he does? He's going to take the money. And when people don't have money, what are they going to be? They're going to be hungry. And a hungry person is easy to control. What does the Bible also say about the last days? It says in the last days it'll take a whole day's wages just to buy a loaf of bread. Why do you think that is, folks? It makes sense if you read it. Paul said that's coming. And we're going to have to. But well, sometimes we're going to come up on hard economic time. And I think it'll get worse before Christ comes back. But you know what? I still believe that before it gets too terribly bad, that Christ is going to split the sky and we're going to be gone. I think that God's going to take care of us. I am a pre-tribulation person, if you want to call it that. You know, there's pre-tribulation, tribulation you know, I mean, uh, and post-trib, when the rapture is going to take place. Look, I believe that when Christ comes back, that's going to mark the beginning of the tribulation that the Bible talks about. And I'm thanking God that I'm going to be there with Him. But you know what? Even if I have to go through it, according to what Paul is saying right here, you know what he's saying right here? It don't matter if you have to go through it because nothing can separate you from the love that God has for you. Nothing. That's what I love about this. Folks, danger is going to come. <coughs> dangers that we're exposed to as Christians simply because we're Christians. You know, well, there's a lot of stuff in the news now that have been being politically correct and, you know, doing all this kind of stuff. Oh, we got to talking about it the other day. Josh and I, Josh thinks, Josh thinks a lot. And Josh, he got a pretty good head on it. But he said, you know what I'm tired of? He said, I'm tired of this generation of kids that's coming up that's been taught in school and everywhere else that they just supposed to wear their shoulders on their sleeves and every time somebody says something that they don't like, just yell out, well, that offends me and it hurts my feelings. He says, you know what? Somebody just needs to grow up. Amen. And I'm thinking, you're right. You're right. You know what? I, that, I don't know if I should say it or not. Nowadays, everybody gets a trophy. Everybody gets a trophy. You know, nobody can fail. 
You know what? One of the best things that I learned and was taught when I was a kid is you ain't always going to win. You do the very best you can and be happy with it. Folks, let me tell you something. A lot of people say things that, that I'm offended at. But I don't make a big deal out of it. You know why? Because I just know that's going to happen. That's life. Life ain't fair. That's what we need to be telling these kids. Life is not fair. But he says that we're going to have danger that comes upon us simply because we're Christians. Listen, we talk about uh, injustice and all that. Nobody, nobody in the news media or any kind of publication that I have ever read has said anything about Christians being killed worldwide simply because they're Christians. You want to talk about injustice? That's it. But Christians don't matter to people in the world. That's what Paul's talking about. He said, Christians, look, they can do anything they want to you. And nobody will say a thing. And y'all, it's happening today. He goes on and says, sword. You know what that means? That means literally this. That Christians will be executed. Christians will be murdered because of their faith in Jesus Christ. You know what one of the last estimates I read was this that there's over a half a million Christians each year today. Each year, over half a million Christians are killed, murdered for their faith. Why do you think Paul added that quotation from Psalm chapter 44 in there? In verse 36, he says, As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the soul. Why do you think he put that in there? Because he knew that Christians would be killed simply for their faith because they stood up for Christ. And you know what? That brings us to a question, an interesting question. Well, hearing all this, if we're going to go through all of this simply because we're Christians, why in the world would anybody want to profess faith in Jesus Christ? Why would anybody want to be a follower of Christ if they're going to go through all these things? Paul's already given us an answer. It's the love of Christ. It's the love of God. It's the greatest thing that there is. You see, it's because of the, it's eternal. It never ends. He says in 1 Corinthians, love never ends. It never ends. And especially God's love. It's eternal. Let me ask the question, do you love Jesus? Yes. Thankfully, somebody answered. <laughs> yes. Yes. Do you love Jesus? Is that what makes you feel secure? Let me tell you something. It ain't got a thing to do with how much you love Jesus that makes us feel secure. It's got everything to do with how much He loves you. Amen. Folks, let me tell you something. You can love Him with all your heart, soul, mind, body, and spirit and everything, and it still ain't as good as His love for you. Paul says that's what makes it worth it. That's what makes it worth being a Christian because of God's love for you. Folks, listen. We don't have to worry about all the other stuff because we have the love of God. He says there's nothing that can separate us. Look, God's love, is, is it's His love for us that gives us our security. It's His love that draws us to Him in the first place. Look, I, I read a story about a chaplain with the, with the United States. And he happened to be Korean back during the Korean conflict. And he was a chaplain. And so there were different POW camps where Americans had captured communist prisoners uh, around, around South Korea. And his job was to go around and minister to those POWs. Now listen, they were communists. They were taught that Christians were the most evil people in the world to kill them. By the way, y'all do know. Do, do, do. Y'all do know that that's who's running our country right now. They're communists. Communist ideal hasn't changed. Christianity has to be destroyed. It has to be destroyed. This chaplain went around those field W camps. He knew he had a tough job right off the bat because he was going to be trying to minister to communists who hated Christianity. Okay? 
And so he prayed and he prayed about it and he decided, okay, here's what I think I'll do. And he went to the first POW camp and he taught them a song. First of all, they were amazed because he spoke Korean. <laughs> And they spoke Korean, so he could communicate with them, and they were amazed by that. But the first thing he did was say, hey, let's learn a little song so we can sing. I mean, we might as well do that and be happy because, you know, you're in a POW camp, you're in prison, and there's not really a whole lot to do, so we'll just sing and be happy. And they said, okay. You know what he taught them? You know what song he taught them? Jesus was. And they started singing it. And so when he'd go to that first camp and he would teach them that song and he'd say, now y'all practice, I'll be back next week. And he'd go to the next POW camp and he'd teach them. And when he'd been to all of them and he had taught all of those communist prisoners, Jesus loves me, he just started filling in a little bit because they started asking questions about what song meant. Bingo. And do you know when they finally signed that agreement to cease fire and ended that war, that over half of those communist prisoners had been converted to Christianity and refused to go back to North Korea or China or wherever they were from, and they stayed in South Korea so that they could worship God because they had accepted Christ. You know why they accepted Christ? Because they understood the love that Christ had. Folks, His love draws us to Him. His love is the only thing that can satisfy us. It's the only thing that can satisfy us. And His love is what keeps us secure. Look, Paul was familiar with the hardships of life. He was familiar with what a Christian would go through. But he was also familiar with the love of Christ. And he said, it's the greatest thing that has ever been. And it's worth whatever we have to go through because of what it does for us. Folks, listen. When Jesus died on that cross, He died on that cross for you. He died on that cross for me. It's the greatest act of love that you can show anybody. It's the greatest act of love. You know, every once in a while, I'll just get a hanker. And I'll go on YouTube and I'll watch all of these stories with surviving warriors that have been awarded the Medal of Honor. Unbelievable sacrifice. Unbelievable. And these are the ones that survive. Most of the time when a Medal of Honor is awarded, it is posthumous. But these guys, when asked why they did what they did, you know what the majority of them say? Because I knew that my buddies, my brothers, were going to die if somebody did. No greater love than this. And lay down his life for his friend. Jesus laid his life down. Folks, that's love. And Paul says it's the greatest thing in this universe and any other universe. And he said, nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. And it's because of his love for us, not how much we love him. It's his love for us. Do you love Jesus? Absolutely. <coughs> but He loved you. Father, thank you for your love. Father, we, we don't understand that kind of love. But Lord, I thank you that you love us that much. And I thank you, Heavenly Father, that that love will sustain us no matter what comes along and whatever comes into our life, it will not change the fact that you love us and you loved us enough to die for us and you love us enough to provide us a home with you for eternity. Father, I praise you for that. I thank you for that. 
I pray, Heavenly Father, if there's someone here this morning that's not yet experienced the love of Christ like that, that today would be the day that that love that you have for them would draw them to the foot of the cross, to be covered by your blood. Heavenly Father, I ask that you would forgive those of us who are Christians for times when we have taken your love for granted. Father, help us to love you enough to be a witness for whatever it is you want us to do. Father, during this invitation, I pray you have your will and your way, that you would be glorified, you would be lifted up, and you would be honored. For it's in your presence, in the holy name, we pray. Amen.